Well, good morning. So we're continuing our study in the book of Hebrews, and I hope that you're as excited as I am, and if not, I hope that I can get you excited about it. Well, some, something I learned this last week about this book itself is that, you know, there's a lot of discussion on, one, the authorship about it. Now, I, I do not believe that it was Paul. I think there's a lot of evidence. We won't go into all of it. But either way, there's some that strongly do still believe it. But one of the things that is kind of unanimous is that this is not a typical epistle or letter. This was not a letter that was written to uh, be sent out and mailed out. That this is probably a sermon, a lesson that was recorded and written down. So I thought that was just a different aspect that I'd never really run across before. I figured all of them were letters. They were all written and mailed out to people. But, but the Hebrews letter apparently does not fit any of that criteria. And it, it kind of makes sense because it is so deep when it comes down to the type of material it's covering. Why does it mean something to us? Because it helps to reveal some very strong truths about the caricature of who Christ was that we have in our idea of who he is. And especially in our century, we believe that, well, he's Christ. Well, that's what we were taught since we were little. Whether you are believe it or not, even if you're an atheist kid in this country, you grow up knowing about this guy, those guys, Christians, believe in this man named Jesus. But to the Hebrew readers or listeners, it had become a challenge for them to maintain their faith. They had gone through some difficult times. At one point, they had come out of Judaism and accepted Christ as a Savior and the one that fulfilled the prophecies. Because that was a style that Paul would do and others. They didn't have a Bible to sit down and say, let's have a Bible study. Go to Ephesians, go to Romans, go to Acts. So what they did, they went to the law, they went to the prophets, they went to the Psalms. And then they would show them the evidence through power, miracles, that would get their attention, wouldn't it? They'd go, oh, okay, yeah, this guy's got some power that nobody does. And then they would listen. And then they would take and go back and show them what Isaiah 53 said. Go to Psalms 22, go to Psalms 110, go to the different Psalms and show, and then go back to historical things. Even Zechariah is one that has some messages about the Messiah. And they'd pull all that out and it all just start coming together. Well, they had become Christians. But during a period of persecution, it seems that there's a time where they started to back away. Life started hitting them. It's kind of like that new Christian. You become a Christian, you're excited about it, and then all of a sudden, you start, life starts pushing back against your faith. So he starts out and he established the fact in the first four chapters about the, the superiority of this man, Jesus. And, and interesting, every time you hear the word Jesus or Christ in this, you don't see them always together. But they're significant to the, the writer because he's trying to establish to the people a character trait or who he's about. It'd be kind of like you say, Ron, the preacher, Ron, the mountain biker, Ron, the dummy, Ron, the sense of humorous, the Ron, the paramedic. It, it adds something else. If you're talking to certain people like you guys, you'd probably say, Ron, our preacher. And then guys that I ride with, there's other Rons, you know, mountain bike, they say, Ron, the mountain biker. And it would associate quickly a character trait of who I am. So when we read and we see this, I want you to remember that as well. If you're the Hebrew reader and you're listening to this, it means something when he says them separate and when he brings them together. And when he started out, it was the man, Jesus. From the beginning, he talks about how God communicated. God communicated in all these different ways. You're aware of them, you old Jew. He talked to the prophets, he used angels, all this, but he doesn't anymore. He speaks to this man, and he doesn't say man, he says through Jesus. He establishes the fact that he's a God. In chapter 2, verse around 7 and 8, he talks about the idea that everything that came into existence was because of him. So now he says this man, because he still uses the word Jesus, he never ties Christ to it. So he still says, Jesus, this man was a God. And then he goes on and exhorts them about some of the great things that he's also accomplished that are far better than anything that they've seen before. Through the prophets, he was a prophet that he now speaks through. Prophets who they spoke through, right? So then also angels. To what angel did the God, the Father, ever say that you will rule? And not only that, aren't angels ministering? So he's greater than the angels. And he's also greater than Moses, the one that gave you the law. Why? Because he not only is a part of the house, which was the Mosaic law, he built it. Who is greater? The one who built it 
or the one who serves in it? Moses. And then he goes through and talks about Joshua. Indirectly by talking about, and Joshua was another great character that they understood how that he had taken them through the land of Jordan and destroyed all their enemies and took the promised land. But it was all about rest. They got that symbology. They understood that symbology because that's what they yearned for. They wanted to come out of slavery from Egypt and get rest. They failed. They wandered through the desert for 40 years. That generation died. They didn't get the rest. Then Joshua brings him over. Remember Joshua? What's the other name for him in the Hebrew? Jesus. Isn't it interesting that Joshua was to bring the people of God into a land of rest? Joshua, Jesus, see the shadow of what he's showing? Isn't that marvelous when you think about that? God didn't do that by accident. He did it as a very powerful teaching point to reinforce, one, his wisdom, but the beauty of what he's trying to accomplish for us. But did they, did they achieve it? No. No, they, they also failed to, to obtain that rest. And on top of that, he says, now, if you'll think about it, in that conversation, every time that God would talk about rest and the prophets would talk about rest, there's another one he kept talking about that seems to be further down the road. And don't you want that one? And the Hebrew writer, the Hebrew readers, they're going, yeah, absolutely, man, we want that rest. That's the rest our fathers couldn't get. That's the rest that nobody's been able to get. We want that rest. He said, it's in Jesus That's where it's at. And then it's like there's this turning point that he turns the knob a little bit tighter. And this is where I think why I'm having to explain this because one last was Sunday. We didn't do Hebrews. But after he goes through all that beautiful things, he gives two warnings as well, doesn't he? He goes through and he gives them a warning about neglecting salvation by drifting. And then he gives them a warning about failing to enter that rest. And at the end of that, then he says, the word of God is like a sword. It will cut through everything. You can sit and say certain things. Now, I'm paraphrasing. This is part of the quote. But you can sit and say, I believe in Jesus all day long. You can sit and say that, you know, oh, yeah, I want that rest. You can do whatever you want on the outside, but the Word of God is going to expose you for who you are. And every time you're exposed, guess what? You're going to come up short. And that doesn't work with God. You can't do that. You can't come up short and be right with God. And we've had this problem from the beginning of the first two humans. We've we've, we've broke that and we fell away. And we started sinning and transgressing. And the only justice that should be delivered would be destruction of us. Because God is pure. That's justice. That may not be right to you, but when you're sovereign God and you're pure like He is, that's justice. It's like going before the judge and the judge gives you exactly what the law states. You know, okay, I was speeding. Okay, $75, bam. Mercy is, He lets you go. (laughs) That's mercy. That's not justice. We want mercy. We don't want justice because we can't stand before God and truly receive mercy. So let's see the problem. So after he just told them that the Word of God is going to expose you, and every time you think about it, you are short. And if you're short, which means you fall short, then justice is God has to punish you. And now he comes to the way that we can be right. The only way that we can be right. We need somebody. We need a priest. It's, you ever seen the people in court, you know, the criminals that think they can? Ted Bundy tried to do it. He tried to represent himself before the judge. And they looked at him, and the guy had like 130. He was a genius, but he was an idiot. He made himself look foolish. He didn't know how to handle himself. You know, that's why courts, a lot of times, you can represent yourself, but you're really silly if you do. There's just an aspect of it. You need somebody else to come up and know the language, represent, be respectful, be credible. And even those who say, I'm going to represent myself, a lot of times, what does the judge do? Appoints him a lawyer that sits beside them. 
to protect them from themselves. Because the judge knows this guy, this person, they're going to get in so much trouble. They try to stand up and ju justify themselves. We need somebody. You can't do it by yourself. So after he says and points out that glaring fact to us, the fact that when that word exposes us for who we are, we have to have something, somebody to stand between us. And so God set it up. And that's the shadow of the priesthood. And so he starts out and starts to now dis establish the fact that this Jesus is a priest. Now, you know what's interesting is he's already started to do this. Now, remember the Jew understood very clearly the promises and the establishment and the organization of Mosaic Law and how the tribes were, were blessed and organized and all that. They, they knew the priesthood. And to be a priest, you had to be of the tribe of the Levites. That's just a general everyday priest. The next is the one that was the most important. See, every, all, every, if you're just a Levite, an average Levi, okay, they called you a priest, but guess what you got to do? You got to clean up the tabernacle. You got to pack it. You got to sweep the floor. You got to minister to the house of God. So don't confuse saying the Levites are priests because it was the high priest who did the most important job. And that was to make them right with God. The patriarchs before Mosaic Law were the high priests of the family. Remember when we were talking about Job. Job, as a patriarch, would offer sacrifices for his family. He was the one that would make things right with God. But the blood of bulls and goats still comes short. And that's what he's trying to show. There's a fallacy here. You see? And so that's what he's going to establish. But he brings it up. In chapter 2, verse 17, when he says here, therefore he had to make him like his brothers in every respect. So what was he before? I'm going to pause there. What does that mean? He had to make him like, well, if he's just a human, he's just a human, right? I mean, you know, come on. What do you got to make him anything else? Why did he insert that there? Because he, you, you and I, if we thought he was just God walking around, then... Well, that's not fair. I mean, come on. How would he understand what it's really like to be lowly little humans and, you know, flesh? So he's connecting again the concept where you're in, earlier introduced, the idea that he is a God that he created, and now saying that, but when he came down, when he came down, the Hebrew writer says, he had to make him like us. He had to make him human, in other words. And every respect, he didn't have anything that you don't have right now this morning. Nothing. He was human. And that's what we have to remember because it helps us to then have a greater respect for what he accomplished. And so he goes on. He says, so that he might what? Now this is a key verse because when we go a little further on, there's a hard verse that we have to deal with about deity and such. But look what he says. He says he, that he might become merciful and faithful high priest. Without him becoming like us, this is one aspect that he would not be able to accomplish. And so he says he had to do that. In service to God, that's what the priest did. And what was it to ultimately accomplish? Is to provide that atonement, that sacrifice between us and God. This is not, again, not a new thing. I mean, the Jews who had been, they grew up Jewish, they had listened to all of these prophets and, you know, probably like you guys growing up, listened to all the sermons of the preachers before. And it just kind of becomes a part of who you are. And, but they hear some of them and a lot of them couldn't understand of them. One of them is this one that I found is Zechariah that I wanted to bring up. The prophet Zechariah. He says in verse, chapter 6, verse 13, he says, Yes, he will build a temple of the Lord. He will bear the glory. And he shall sit and rule on his throne so that he will be a priest on his throne and the council of peace shall be between them both. What does that show us? See, if you had no idea, the idea of what, what this was all about, in other words, until after he came, you'd say, okay, that's, kind of cool. Wait a minute. Whoa, 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 whoa. 
he's going to be a king and a priest? You know, the Pharisees would be going, whoa, 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 you can't do that. That's violation of the law. This was written over 500 years before. Psalms 2 and Psalms 110 that Jack read, we're going to see that the Hebrew writer is going to bring those in as well to remind them, this is not new, guys. We're not making this up. This this didn't come up. This has been in the plan for over thousands of years. In the last 500 years earlier, he expressed it. So when he transitions about the Word of God and how it exposes us, he's now got to show them that he can be the priest, the fallacy of the priesthood that was established under Moses, and the greatness of what he's accomplishing in doing so. And that he's also a king. And how do you do that under Mosaic law? It doesn't legally work. And God just can't arbitrarily, you know, in Mosaic law, he's already said and stated in Mosaic law that this is the way it is. God won't even usurp or break Mosaic law. He can't do that. God does not break his own law. Because I used to think, no big deal. God said it. He's sovereign. Now he's a priest and a king. But even God will not go against what he established in the Mosaic law. So now he starts. And at the end of chapter 4, he then makes this. He says, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we might receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Do you see how Hebrews 2, 7 tied in the idea again? He ties in the idea that he had to be made like us so that we could understand that he could see that. You notice he says this word is very, it's not missed by the Jew, passes through the heaven. What was the temple? We're going to talk about that. These are the shadows that are so beautifully brought out before us as we look at this. And so he says we have not only this high priest who he's already established is God. He had to be brought into the form of flesh in order to be able to understand us. Now, where is he gone? He's on the other side of the heavenly veil. And we're going to talk about some more of that. So continuing now in this conversation... He's going to explain the priesthood. He says, For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relationship to God, to others gifts, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently without the ignorant, with the ignorant and the wayward, since he himself is beset with weaknesses. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes his honor for himself but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. As he says in another place, You are a priest after the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became a source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So, He just simply talks and explains to them, you know what the Jewish rule was, the law. That God had chose from men a man designated. In Exodus 28.1 and in Exodus 40, we find the great long, as everything's being built and established, that God calls out to Moses, which, by the way, what tribe is he from? Bonus round. He's also a Levite. Ah, because when he was anointing Aaron, I asked myself, whoa, wait a minute, what makes, what gives Moses the right 
to necessarily, other than, okay, I'll pull the God card. You know, okay, God said he could do it. But then I thought, no, 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 there's something. And then it dawned on me, he's a Levite himself. Moses was a priest. He was a, from the tribe of the Levites. But when he anoints, God says, get Aaron, bring them to the tabernacle. They offer the sacrifice. They go through this incredible richer blood. They put blood on the earlobes, on their toes. They do all this, this amazing things that we could whole, whole study just on. And he says, now present them before the people. These are now the descendants are going to serve as the high priest. Not just any priest, but the one that's going to be able to come before me. And that I'll accept. Because that's important too. You see, because in the past, there had been people that tried to step before God and explain that we are a priest. Korin, the rebellion of Korin, tried to take over the priesthood. And what happened to him? God opened up the earth and swallowed him. This king named Saul, what he tried to do? He tried to offer sacrifices when he waited too long. Nope. God ripped the kingdom out of his hand. Uzziah, a very righteous king, very good king, very few good kings, he thought, you know what? I'm going to go to the temple and, and I'm going to offer incense. God struck him with leprosy. Another man, no matter how righteous he is, cannot proclaim themselves a priest. Only God can do that. And he says, what was their purpose? They're appointed to act on behalf of men before God. You can't do it. You have to have somebody go between you. And the same thing, what is he to do? He's to offer the sacrifices to atone for you. In Exodus 12, 40, I'm going to skip past that, but if you want to go and look, just for time's sake, because I know I could keep going on and on because this is so, so dynamic and so amazing when we look at this. But this is the, the place in Exodus chapter 40 where he talks about it. But it's interesting how he washes them and he anoints them and consecrates them. And it's a perpetual, look at the last verse there. It says, to them a perpetual priesthood throughout their generations. Nobody else could step in. Levites. So where's, the, where's Jesus? What tribe is he from? Judah. Okay, we got a problem. You see, whenever he was talking about that, what's fascinating is as the Hebrew writer, the, the Hebrews are listening to this, and they're listening, they're, they're listening, he brings up this, this idea that he's a priest. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Click, click. And, and, and I know, I know, with the Holy Spirit working through this man writing this Hebrew letter, sitting there going, I'm going to have to deal with this one. <laughs> I just can't blow by this. But he piques their interest, doesn't he? When he says that he's been made a priest. Whoa, whoa, whoa. And then he goes on. And he keeps bringing, and he brings up Melchizedek. And he brings up Melchizedek again. They know him. Psalms 2, Psalms 110 that we read. They know about Melchizedek historically because of Abraham's encounter with him and they know him through the Psalms and they know something about this priesthood is still there. But is Melchizedek a Jew? No. He was a high, he was a high described as a high priest of God before the covenant was made between Abraham. Well, maybe not that, depending on which one but definitely over 500 years before the Mosaic Law was established and the priesthood was established under Moses. There was a priest to the Most High God. So it comes before. It's greater than. And he's going to deal with Melchizedek in chapter 7 a lot more because he's leaving that kind of hanging there as well. So what is the one purpose about the human factor, he says? He says that it's because he can gently deal with the ignorant and the wayward. That's us. <laughs> Ignorant, you know, there's some that just don't know. A part of the atonement, Yom Kippur, that would occur was that the sacrifice was a part of a national sin that they may not know that's going on to help cover those up in a way. The wayward are those who are going their own way, going a rebellious way or such. Sinful. 
So that's what they were to do. Because I'm a human, I should be able to understand what you're going through. The irony is that 125 years before Jesus came, they had over 29 high priests. Now you think, no big deal. Remember I said perpetual? In other words, it had to stay in the line of Aaron. Not just a Levite, but Aaron. Aaron's son, Aaron's son's son. And it had to be the firstborn of Aaron's sons. Uh, they had over 29 high priests. Now you wonder, so what? How many presidents did we have in 125 years? Well, I looked that up for you. 26. Teddy Roosevelt. So we go back to our first president, put this into perspective, and we know that you know they, some served two terms. Theodore, I mean, um, uh, the second Roosevelt served three terms, but Teddy and everybody before that, one to two terms. Four years, that's it. Do you really think that that son, the descendant, only lived four years? You see the turmoil? that started developing in the priesthood, and that by the time that Jesus came, you had two high priests, Cepheus and Ananias. Why? That's not what God established. Because it lost exactly what we're reading about here. And look at the arrogance of Cepheus. Look at the arrogance that they had that he did display. Do you think they really cared about the people? They had become political. All they cared about was pleasing Rome. All they cared about was getting rich and moving on. They would not stay in that office like they were supposed to. They would trade out. And when Rome didn't like the priest, the high priest, they would get him another one. And so, guess what? Hence, Cepheus. And Ananias was the one that should be serving but the Romans didn't like him. So the high priest could, by the time Jesus came, and from this point historically, the people knew it was broke. It was just a joke. But it's not a joke to God. Not a joke to God. Now, he brings up this aspect about that understanding is because why did he have to go twice? He says he's obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins just as he does for the people. Isn't he one of the people? Why doesn't the one for the people cover him as well? It would, right? Because he's just one of the people. Ah, that was a reminder. That's the moment that when he got so tired of preaching sermons every Sunday, oh, sorry, so tired of offering sacrifices and listening to the people that he would remind himself that this brutality that I'm putting on this animal and cutting this throat and bleeding this animal out and taking that blood and going into the Holy of Holies is for me. No one else has to do that. Everybody else gets lumped into the next one. But I have to go in there before God for me, before I go in there for you. So that was one of the greatest parts of that. The Holy of Holies was a pattern of heaven. The throne room, the mercy seat on top of the Ark of the Covenant. And in that mercy seat in between the cherubims that their wings were coming out, was where God was to be dwelling. And when he would come around that tent with the first time, he would take blood and he would put it on the mercy seat. And God said, blood is life. So he would come around and offer an atonement for himself. And then, as we look at that, he's saying that is a picture of heaven. Remember what the Hebrew writer said? He said, he went where? Through heaven's and where's he at now? He's in what they had recognized as something very physical. So who's better? The priest who has to bring blood in for himself, and it's just a shadow, it's just a tent or a tabernacle or a temple eventually, but or get to stand before God himself and look at God and be the sacrifice. 
I don't know about you, but I think this one's the better one. Far more superior. Because those guys could never truly get in the presence of God. And so it was an important factor to them to see this and understand that as he's coming through and going to show the greatness of this priesthood of Jesus. You see the problems we already have? They knew them physically because of all the different priesthood. They saw that. And then they see the limitations of this physical building that that's not it. He just told them that their high priest is now in heaven. Where would you want your priest to be? In a building down the road? Or with God? Kind of rhetorical, right? <laughs> Do you see how he's bringing the right readers along and showing them? And it's not without facts. It's with Scripture. He's showing them. Nobody, then he comes back and says, takes that honor for themselves. Like I mentioned earlier, those who ever tried to, it ended poorly for them. But only by God. And then he links Aaron. Historically, you guys remember that? I'm acting like you're the readers of the letter. You remember that? You remember that story when you were growing up? How Aaron in Exodus 40, they didn't have those verses. How Moses had taken him and did all that? Just like the way God called out Aaron? Remember that? That's right. Only God could pick him. So Christ, notice, remember what, what I tell you about when you find identifiers of who he is as a person? It changed. See this? Now the writer went from Jesus, the man, to the Messiah, the anointed, Christ. Also, Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed. So he didn't, he didn't just come along and get this little cult together and say, okay, I'm going to be the high priest. No, this is all something that his father God the Father had chose and put upon him. And there he brings scripture that they can relate to. They would go, we've heard that. Didn't ever understand it exactly, but this really works. He was appointed by him who said to him, who said to his Jesus, the Christ, the Son God, you are my son, today I have begotten you. That word begotten is not something we use every day. I don't go around and say, hey, guess what? I've begotten my son today. What? Oh, I'm sorry. Suzanne had a child. <laughs> we, don't, we don't use, kind of archaic. There's a lot of things that I read about this that people, some say, well, that's when he raised him. He begot him. No. No, that's not. Even the Greek kind of indicates and clears it up. It's brought forth genealogically established a relationship, and also brought forth. And what did he do? He just described it. He brought him down a little lower than angels, brought him into the form of a man, because he had to experience that. Remember that word too. He had to experience that in order for him to qualify. And he says, that's when I begot you. I brought you forward. When you accomplish all this, that's what he did. And he also says in another place, and that's why I love, I think, the Hebrew writer, because I'm like that. Can you always remember the book, chapter, and verse? <laughs> He's already said, and I didn't bring it up. He'll say, and it's somewhere else in the Bible. He doesn't say the Bible. And it's written another place. And he says it here. He doesn't say. That's another reason why I don't think this is Paul. Because, see, Paul never said words like this. Paul was a Pharisee. That dude knew his law. He would say, it is written. Search his letters. He never uses this ambiguity. Paul didn't need to. He knew it. He'd say, it's written. Lawyers talk like that. Lawyers don't talk like this. Yeah, it's written somewhere. I paraphrase sometimes. I do that. You do that. It is also written in another place. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Come on, give me more, give me more. <laughs> the Jews sitting there going, you're tantalizing, you're teasing. What is this about Melchizedek? And he's like, hold on, we'll get there, we'll get there. Settle down. But we got to establish the fact that, one, he is a priest. Then I'll show you legally how he accomplished it. One, I just told you, nobody can establish themselves as a priest unless it's God. And God did that. He begot him. He brought him forward. 
after he suffered those things and he went through it. And that's something where we have a hard time. We'll see where he talks about the idea of when we read about obedience. I mean, how does God learn obedience? I thought that God knows everything. How, how do you make a God perfect? Haven't you ever been challenged with some of these words? You read through it and you go, oh, wait a minute, Ron. You're telling me he's God, that he pre-existed, because that's what the Hebrew writer said. That's what John says. I thought that was a part of an aspect of God. It is. Until you have the idea that a God that ever put himself in the form of the creature and lived through that, that's something he had never done. When you're a God and you've never experienced in the actual dwelling of the creature that you made, the suffering, then you don't know. Perfection doesn't mean he was imperfect in that sense, but made complete. It completed the purpose of what he was accomplishing, what he was doing, is what he's pointing out. I can almost hear the writer now take a sigh. It's kind of like you've ever had a serious conversation with somebody and you, tell, you can tell, you look at them and you go, oh, you're drifting off. I do that when I'm up here preaching sometimes. I can look out and go, oh, man, I lost Jack. I'm picking on Jack. Oh, he's dozing. You know, uh, you know I, I can almost, I can feel this for, you know, the Hebrew writer sitting there going, oh, man, he's, he's on a roll. He's talking about Melchizedek and he's going through this and showing them how God did this and Aaron and all this. And he goes, oh, man. I got to stop. And then he says this to them. About this, we have much to say. And it's hard to explain since you've become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have the powers discern, trained by a constant practice to distinguish between evil and good. So that's, that's what I mean about he can sit there and say this. It's like, are you listening? Do you really want to know this? I mean, because that's what happens to us sometimes. We get a little bit excited, but after a time in our relationship with God, then we all of a sudden stop. We just kind of get bored with it, or we, we stop listening. And he, he, he really exposes it because he says, you're not babes in Christ. You're not brand new to this. You're at a point, actually, that some of you should be teaching this. So how about you? Where are you at? I don't know. But I know that Word of God does, right? Because it discerns, it separates, divides. It exposes us. God knows. And that's something we need to consider for a moment. Two things. One, have we become dull of hearing? Have we kind of spiritually drifted off of sleep whenever we start thinking of the Bible or we start thinking about spiritual things? And the other one is, he's not talking about preaching. He already said, if we go back and look at Paul's letters, he says, everybody has a different talent. Everybody has a different thing that God has blessed them with. But can you not at least express the gospel? What is the gospel, by the way? If I was to walk you up, if I was able to snapshot you and we were to go over here, and I, I was to be able to quiz and say, okay, Dorothy, what's the gospel? Darren wants the gospel. Crystal, what's the gospel? Jack, what's the gospel? What's the gospel? Could you teach me? Where would you start? Because if you can't do that, maybe you've become dull of hearing. Maybe you're not growing the way that he said. I mean, can you imagine a 60-year-old walking around with a bottle of milk in his mouth? One milk bothers my stomach, and I am 60, so maybe I'm picking on myself. But think about that for a moment. 
Every time you go somewhere, he's got a bottle of milk, and that's all he does. No, no, man, I can't eat that stuff. Now, I know I'm losing teeth, and it's getting harder to chew a few things, but the point is, not that, it's that I don't want anything else. That that's the only thing that can really sustain me and keep me alive is just the milk. We would look at an individual like that and say, there's something wrong with them. And we would know that if you have a child after they're born, there reaches a point, they have to start eating food. You know what it's called when they don't? In the medical world, it's called fail to thrive. And most normal moms will take their child to a doctor to find out why is my child not. And the body will start to eat itself because the body is trying to grow but it can't because it's not getting the right nutrients it needs to sustain itself. That happens spiritually to us. If we do not move beyond the milk, we will consume ourselves. We will atrophy spiritually. And you won't even be able to talk about the gospel. So it's very fitting the way he says that. You got to go back, guys. Go back. And if you need to go back to the milk, that's fine. Because he's not talking literal. He's talking about get back to the basic oracles then and get involved in them, know them, own them, learn to love them again. Because that's what helped sustain them through the last persecution that they had to deal with. What happens when you don't have this ability? What happens? You're not protected. You're in danger. Why would you do that? Why would you leave yourself? Now, there's some people that want to be vulnerable, I guess. But what happens, he says, is he says, those who have the powers of discernment are trained by constant practice to be able to distinguish between good and evil. If you're drinking milk, he's saying, you can't. You can't defend you. Just like a child. If you think about a, a human life form that is only drinking milk, they usually are at the age and the ability that they cannot protect themselves, can they? They have to have somebody else do it. And unfortunately, too many Christians are depending on elders and preachers to do the defending while they suckle on milk. Right? And I'll tell you, like a dad, I can't protect you. You know, just like with my son. Just like, you know, you can't. You have to get to a point, like a child, to where you can stand spiritually on your own. That's a mean world out there. It's a mean spiritual world. And if you can't defend yourself, it will eat you up and drag you back. Can you distinguish between good and evil? Well, I'll tell you what, our society can't. It's calling things that are evil good, and those things that are good, they're calling it evil. And it's going to become so blurred that I can see in the future where Christians are going to start doing it too. You see, that's how that silly little comedy in 1970s called Three's Company started us down a road that everybody used to laugh when I would use this as, a, as an illustration. I said, what are you talking about? <laughs> now, granted, I, I watched it, and it's hilarious. It's about... Three people living together, they're not married, and one of them is acting like he's gay. And we laughed about homosexuality and the immorality of living together. And it, it just, but they never said it. They never would say it out loud. They'd get you to laugh at it, you see. Smoke and mirrors. We went from Ozzy and Harriet where when they would film on stage, that if you'll notice, there were always two beds. Ozzy and Harriet, had, they, they slept in twin beds. Even though, oh, by the way, no, my grandparents did not live in, sleep in twin beds. But because of the morals, they wouldn't even film them in the same bed. And they had to keep one foot on the floor when they were laying down. Isn't that crazy? Now, try to get them with clothes on, you know, when you film. So don't tell me that it's, the slippery slope is overused. Don't tell me that people, Christians, are not going to start thinking that good is evil and evil is good, that we're, we're not going to start losing that focus. We are. And it starts out very slowly, doesn't it? The beauty, once again, is we have this high priest. And he's not standing in some building 
interceding. And he does not have to take blood continually in there because he was the perfect sacrifice. Is he your high priest? No matter what we think about priesthood, whatever we've been thinking, you know what? We cannot survive spiritually without having a high priest still until we finally make it home to heaven. So we're going to continue in this marvelous book next week so you know where we're at. I encourage you to go back and read. Keep tying these passages together because that's what you have to do. We're ripping sections out because we don't have all week for you to stay here and me to teach you. So I need your help in reading. Go back to one. We're not too far back. Read past six and seven. Look at the flow so that as I come in and we start to really discuss some details, some great things, you'll start to go, oh, wow, yeah, I see that. We're doing that in the book of Romans this afternoon as well. Another amazing book. It's way over my head too. It's an amazing book. I hope that you will come back and join us and be able to be with us. If you're with us this morning, there's something we can do to help you in your relationship with God, whether to establish it or to help to mend it. We hope that you will let us be a part of that service to you. So we're going to sing this invitation song, and it's a time for each of us to reflect within ourselves how we've been walking before our Heavenly Father. Use that high priest. If you've already become a Christian, you have a high priest. Take advantage of that. Turn to him. And he is faithful to forgive you of your sins as we decide to turn, repent. We're going to fall again. We know that. It's not a perfection we can accomplish here, but it's something the blood of Christ perfects us. So think about these things. We can help you. Come forward while we stand and we sing. Follow Jesus, standing for the right, holding up his banner in the thickest fight, listing for his orders, ready to obey. Who will follow Jesus, serving him today? Who will follow Jesus? Who will make reply? I am on the Lord's side, Master, hear him I. Who will follow Jesus? Who will make reply? I am on the Lord's side. Master, here am I. Who will follow Jesus in life's busy ways? Working for the Master, giving Him the praise. Earnest in His vineyard, honoring His laws. Faithful to His counsel, watchful to his cause. Who will follow Jesus? Who will make reply? I am on the Lord's side. Master, here am I. Who will follow Jesus? Who will make reply? I am on the Lord's side. Master, here am I. Who will follow Jesus in his work?